Tonight, I want to talk with you about the mark of the beast. There are a lot of beasts in the Bible, but Revelation 13, 1 is one that you'll need to take a look at. I stood upon the sand of the sea, saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now in Daniel 7, 17, just write this down. When you're studying Bible prophecy, a beast represents a nation or a kingdom. Hmm? A beast represents a nation or a kingdom. I can preach better tonight because I got freedom in both hands. <laughs> just want to tell you that. Stood up on the sand of the sea, and a kingdom rose up out of the sea. Now, Revelation 17, 15 says, And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Now, if people say you can't understand the book of Revelation, well, the book of Revelation explains itself. When you read about a beast, that's talking about a kingdom in prophecy. When you read about the sea and the waters, that's talking about peoples and kindreds and tongues. So that when you look at the verse, what you really see is a nation rising up where there are large populations of people. Now, that's all you, you read. Now, this nation is peculiar in that it's got seven heads and ten horns. How many heads? How many horns? Now, slip over to Revelation 17, and I find something kind of like that, if you don't mind. Uh, beginning with verse 3 of Revelation 17. So he carried me away into the spirit, into the wilderness. And I saw a woman, I saw what? Sit upon a scarlet colored beast, sit upon a beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Got that? Now the kingdom of Revelation 13 has got how many heads? Seven heads and ten horns. This kingdom of Revelation 17 has got what? Seven heads and ten horns. Now, in this 17th chapter book of Revelation, it lets us know what the heads are and even tells us who that woman was. How about that? Now, if you go down to verse 9, here is the man which hath wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. All right. So then if the seven heads are seven mountains in Revelation 17, hundred and seven heads are seven mountains in Revelation 13. Talk to me. Now, who is the woman sitting on the animal? Look at verse 18 of Revelation 17. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city what is she? A great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Man, that's plain enough, isn't it? So all we got to do is find a city that sits on seven mountains. Talk to me. That rules. Wait a minute. Got to get another one in there. That rules over the kingdoms of the earth. Then we know what we're talking about. Now, there are two characteristics here. Number one, a city that sits on seven mountains and that rules over the kingdoms of the earth. As I study the cities of the nations, I found three cities. No, four cities 
that sit on seven hills. One of them is San Francisco, California. I'm looking for John City. John got him a city here that sits on seven hills and that rules over the kingdoms of the earth. San Francisco sits on seven hills, but it doesn't even rule over California. Are you listening to me? Uh, the capital of California is Sacramento, not San Francisco. So San Francisco is out. Three more. I found a city called Hong Kong. Hong Kong sits on seven hills. But Hong Kong doesn't even rule over Malaysia. The capital of Malaysia is Kuala Lumpur. Are you listening to me? So that gets rid of Hong Kong. They are down to two now. The third city that I found was Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh was built on seven hills. But Pittsburgh doesn't even reign over Pennsylvania. The capital of Pennsylvania is Hagerstown. Are you listening to me? Uh, Harrisburg, somebody said. Who cares? Just so it's not Pittsburgh. <laughs> Harrisburg is the capital of Pennsylvania. But Harrisburg doesn't sit on seven hills, so we can just wipe Harrisburg out. And you can get rid of Pittsburgh, too. What do you say? Now, one city remains. And that is the city of Rome in Italy. Rome was not only built on seven hills, but Rome was the capital of the world under the Caesars and reigned over the kings of the earth. Talk to me now. So now we know what we're dealing with in Revelation 13. We are dealing with Rome. And out of Rome, there comes a power that has a mark that's got a number and that's got a name. All right. yes, sir. And furthermore, in verse 2, it says that the dragon gave this power his seat, his authority, and his power. Now the dragon of Revelation 12 and Revelation 17 is pagan Rome. Pagan Rome yielded its authority, its power, and its seat to papal Rome. You're not listening to me. Now, papal Rome was a peculiar thing, but papal Rome took over the Roman seat of authority when Emperor Constantine, in A.D. 330, moved his capital to Istanbul. Yes. Hmm. All right. there you are. True. And in A.D. 330, when Constantine moved to Istanbul and renamed it Constantinople, you know, listen, that left Rome to the papacy. The dragon gave him his seat. Lord have mercy. You're not listening to me. Pagan Rome gave papal Rome his seat and his authority and said, you do what you want to do from Rome. I'm going to do what I want to do from Istanbul. And I call that Constantinople. Hold on, boy. And did the Pope accept the invitation? For the papacy is a form of government headed by a pope. Papacy is another form of the word 
popery. Right. The papacy is a combination of church and state. Right. That's why you saw the woman sitting on the, the dragon. The dragon was pagan Rome. The woman was papal Rome. Turn to Jeremiah 6 2. It says, I have likened the daughter of Zion unto a beautiful and comely woman. That's right. Zion, in Bible prophecy, is symbolized by a woman. So the woman represents the church, and the dragon represents the state. Look at And out of that peculiar government that originated in Rome, in a city that sits on seven hills. Yes, sir. Hmm? That ruled over the kings of the earth. Out of there came a number and a mark that has got Nashville, Tennessee messed up tonight. What is the mark of this beast? And what is the number of his name? Well, I can give you the number of his name. Because of one of the titles of the Bishop of Rome is Vicar of the Son of God. In Latin, that's Vicarious Filii Dei, or Vicarious Filia D. Now the value, the Roman Numen value of the letters in the title, Vicar of the Son of God, totals up to 666. So, the number of his name is just like John said it here in Revelation 13, 18. Here is wisdom, I read. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and 6. Vicarious Philii D. It is the one of the titles of the Bishop of Rome. Rome was a city on seven hills. From it, Rome ruled the world. And her number, 666. Six, six. This is the number of the papacy, which rules from Vatican City in Rome. The popes got so powerful during the Middle Ages that they were able to make a king, old King Henry IV, stand out in the snow. You're not listening to me. They made Henry IV stand out in the snow barefoot for hours waiting for an audience with the Pope. She reigned over the kings of the earth. Her number, 666. But what was her mark? Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have to go straight to her to discover what her mark is. And will you listen to this? I am reading from a doctrinal catechism by Dr. Stephen Kinnon on page 174. What is the mark of the papacy? I read. Had she not such power, I read, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday. The first day of the week, it says here, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. Did you hear that? Out of Rome, from the papacy, out of Vatican City, the city that sits on seven hills, comes this statement. We know that we've got authority. Because if we didn't have that kind of power... We couldn't have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week, for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day, a change for which there is no scriptural authority. 
And that comes out of a Catholic catechism, if you please. But hold on. In a letter written November 1895 by H.F. Thomas, Chancellor to Cardinal Gibbons, a Roman Catholic cardinal, replying to an inquiry as to whether the Catholic Church changed the day from, sun, sun, from Saturday to Sunday, he answered, Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical authority in religious things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to find out what the mark is, I have to go to the beast to get the answer. The beast of Revelation 13. A religious power that is located in a city that is built on seven hills. A power from which the world was controlled for over 1260 years. I go to her and ask her, what is the mark of your authority? And she says, we changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. And she says, there isn't any Bible for it, only the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. And she says, it is the mark of our ecclesiastical authority. There it is, in plain language. <clears throat> Perhaps a little bit of history here will be useful. The first the law designating Sunday as a day of worship was written in A.D. 314. This is what it says, and I read. Let all judges and townspeople and the occupation of all trades rest on the venerable day of the sun. This is the first law commanding the observance of Sunday that man ever wrote. On March 7, A.D. 321, Emperor Constantine took this same law and enlarged it to cover not merely civil servants, but everybody in the empire. Then came 330, when Emperor Constantine, who made this law, while he was a pagan, in an attempt to unite the Christians and the pagans in his empire. In the year AD 330, he moved to Istanbul, changed the name, and left Rome to the Catholic authorities. It did not take them long to call a church council, called the Council of Laodicea. In the Council of Laodicea, which took place A.D. 336 to 364, 150 actions were taken by that council burying the Seventh-day Sabbath and exalting Sunday as a day of worship. I'm going to read one of them for you now. This is taken from a history of the councils of the church from the original documents. And I'm quoting from section 93, canon 29, and from volume 2, page 316. Listen to this. Quote, The change of the Sabbath is the title. Christians should not Judaize or be idle on Saturday, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day they shall especially honor as being Christians. If, however, they be found Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. Quotation from the Council of Laodicea, A.D. 336 to 364. Now I'm going through this dull stuff, but I got some excitement just around the corner. Can you hold on? I said, can you hold on? Believe it or not, what I just did for you 
was dig out of history why the majority of Christians keep Sunday. They keep it because a man by the name of Constantine, while he was a pagan, wrote a law that it should be kept. And the Roman church followed up by adopting Constantine's law and taking credit for the change. Now, I'm through with the dull stuff. I'd like to show you from the Bible what God said. Because no church council has the authority to change the law of God. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17 to 19, Think not that I've come to destroy the law. Ah, the prophets. I'm come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Hmm? He said, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle, that's the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T, the Greek word iota is there. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law until all be fulfilled. Till the heavens passed, or till the earth passes, not even the dotting of an I or the crossing of a T will be changed in my law, God says. And here comes a church and a Roman emperor changing a whole commandment. Ladies and gentlemen, it won't stand. When you go to your Bible, to the fourth commandment, it still says... Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Now there's no room for, for movement in there. Because the is a definite article. When you say the seventh day. Honey, you've done nailed down a day. Is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And nobody argues which day the seventh day is. In this Catholic document, it is specified as Saturday, the seventh day. And they said, we changed your day of worship from that seventh day to the first day. We did it. Man did it. The Lord said, no, it's seventh day, not first day. It's interesting about that number seven in the Bible. Highly significant. The number seven. Uh, there are seven churches in Revelation. Seven stars. Seven candlesticks. Seven seals. Seven trumpets. Going to preach about that when, uh, Friday night. Seven thunders. The seven angels. And the seven plagues. So I haven't got no problem with the seventh day. The animal world is divided into seven departments. You got the mammalia, you got the birds, you got the reptiles, you got the fishes, you got the radiata, you got the molluscus, and you got the articulated. Only seven of them, son. Animal kingdom divided into seven divisions. So I don't have any problem with the seven day. That goes right along with seven. The vegetable kingdom is divided into seven classes. You got the hardy plants. You got succulent plants, you got the climbing plants, you got the parasites, you got the hibiscus plants, you got the grasses, you got the cellular plants, seven in all. I don't have any problem with the seven day. Cereals are divided into seven big divisions. You got wheat, oats, barley, maize, rice, rye, and millet. No problem with me, seven day, because that number seven seems to be pretty close to the Lord. Is it by accident that the rainbow has got seven colors? Huh? That red, yellow, orange, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Seven. I've got no problem with seven day. Vibrations in light waves at the rate of between 13 and 55,000 per second produces sound. 33 octaves above the range of hearing we come to other vibrations called light. Now, let's let that alone. 
Many urologists have divided the mineral kingdom into seven classes. You didn't know that? Geographers have divided the surface of the world into seven continents and seven seas. What's wrong with seven day? Yes, sir. All right. Ethnologists, ethnologists have divided the life of man into seven stages. Infancy, childhood, youth, adolescence, manhood, decline, and then senility. God saved me from the last one. But as long as I got my good senses, I got no problem with the seventh day. People who study the human body, physiology and anatomy, said that the body consists of seven main parts. A head and a neck and a trunk, that's three. Two arms and two legs, that's seven. So I got no problem with the seventh day. To enable man, to enable man to see, hear, breathe, smell, taste, eat, and speak, seven functions. God provided him with two eyes, two ears, two nostrils, and one mouth. I ain't got no problem with the seventh day. How did it come about, listen to me, how did it come about that the human ear responds to seven distinct intervals in a scale of one octave? You see, I've got no problem with the number seven. That's God's number. So when he got ready to give man a day on which to worship him, he said, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not. And he wrote it in stone, meaning that it's permanent. All right. All right. Amen. Amen. Told you I had some excitement here tonight. Funny thing. When the Lord decided that he's going to seal his children, he decided on two seals. Here's why I'm going to teach some of y'all who know everything. I probably, you come out here, I teach you something. I don't care who you are. This is, this is God's book, and it's my study. I show up and teach you something. Well, the Lord got ready to seal man. You know what a seal is. The old ancient kings used to seal every document that they sent out. Now a seal was either embedded in a ring. And when the man affixed his seal to a document like a notary public does. Are you listening? There were three things that made up that seal. And that had to do with the authority of the document. If the document had the king's seal on it, then you ought to listen to it and obey it. If it didn't have the king's seal, forget it. What are those three things? Had the name of the king, his title or position, and the territory that he governs. Now hold on. When the Lord proposed the seal by which he would set his children aside, he said, I've got two of them. I've got an internal seal, and then I've got an external one. Now, the internal seal of the living God, the internal mark, you find in the book of Matthew, 22nd chapter, 37 to 39. And I read, And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love. With all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. The internal sign. The internal mark of God. The primary mark of God. Is love. Amen. Thou shalt love the Lord. That's his name. Look at it. Who is the Lord? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God. As his life office. Who is the Lord? Thy God. Where is his territory? All thy heart. All thy soul. And all thy mind. That's his territory. 
and that's his primary seal and that's his internal seal and if you don't have that seal nothing else matters for though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love I am nothing and if I could understand all mysteries and have enough faith to move mountains and I have not that internal seal which is the love of God I am nothing. Mm-hmm. Amen. Well, whenever God gets ready to make a saint out of a sinner, the first thing he does is implant in the heart of that sinner his own character. And his character is love. For he that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Amen. And that's what makes a saint out of a sinner is the love of God. Implanted in the human heart. In John 13, 35. By this shall all men know. That you are my disciples. If you have love. One for the other. So then the internal sign. Of the presence of God. In the life of a man. Is the agape. The unselfish character. Love of God. Implanted in the heart by the. Power of the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5. Hope maketh not a shame, for the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Now that's the internal thing. Now once a man accepts the love of God, then he's ready for the law of God. You're not ready for the law of God unless you already got the love of God. Talk to me. For in John the 14th chapter and the 15th verse, it says, If ye love me, keep my commandments. I'd never preach the commandments to a man that I haven't preached the love of God to. Because only when we love him can we obey him. People that don't love him are wasting their time sitting up in church. If ye love me, boy, that's a personal relationship. Huh? If you love me, that's me one-on-one with God. Talk to me. Huh? You can't talk away the commandments with a relationship. It's the relationship that brings the law of God into the life. If ye love me, keep my commandments. There it is, boy. So those Christians that run around knocking the law are knocking the Lord. For the law is the law of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so the internal sign is love. Love the Lord my God with everything. Soul, mind, strength, heart. And my neighbor like I love myself. And when I get that, then I don't stumble when the law of God is taught me. Now somebody's mad as fire right now. But the, the problem is not in what I'm saying. It's in the condition of your heart. The love of God hadn't done its work in there. If it had, you'd say, thank the Lord. You know the seven days Sabbath. Amen. Even your horse wants to rest on Sabbath. <laughs> I used to be down south, uh, further than Nashville. <laughs> and some of the folk down there would say, you know, Rev, I, I knew there was something wrong. Because I ain't never wanted to work on Saturday. <laughs> it, it, it's in you. Not to want to work on the Lord's day. And the Sabbath is the Lord's day. Sunday is not the Lord's day. Three times in the Bible, Saturday is called the Lord's day. In Mark 2, 27, 28, it says the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Son of man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Son of man is Christ, Lord of the Sabbath. Lord of man, Lord of the Sabbath. There it is. And in Isaiah 58, 13, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, the Lord calls the Sabbath his holy day. And then that fourth commandment, seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, thy God. When you deal with Sabbath, you're dealing with the Lord. Seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord, thy God. So there you are. So now the law of God comes in. After love comes in. We preach the law after we preach the gospel. Preach a man into the kingdom, then acquaint him with the laws of the kingdom. 
Talk to me. Don't stand up teaching the law to him and his heart is yet unbroken, unsubdued by the love of God. Let him look at Calvary before he looks at Mount Sinai. Don't take a man to Mount Sinai until you take him to Calvary. For it was on Golgotha that the sun grew dark with mystery and the morn was cold and chill and the shadow of a cross arose upon a lonely hill. It was on Golgotha that a drop of blood framed in a sweaty tear fell down on a blade of grass and mingled with the dew its message clear. Christ died for you. Golgotha first. Yes, sir. And when the blood signs my name, then man, read me the law of God. Because I love him now. And I want to please him. I want to know what he wants me to do. Talk to me now about the will of God. And tell me you're not listening to the truth. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yes, yes. Let's close with this. There's a whole lot. You know, to talk about darkest Africa. Let me tell you something funny. While in Europe, people were riding their horses bareback and eating their meat raw. You've heard of Attila the Hun? You've heard of Ora Asa? Yes. Yeah, have you heard of the Goths? The Visigoths? And the Ostrogoths? Now, some of you have the mistaken notion that Europe has always been an enlightened continent. And that Africa was the dark one. I got news for you. There's been heathenism everywhere. And it wasn't until Muhammad drove Christianity out of Palestine into Europe that Europe began to wake up. Where? You hear what I say? I said, did you hear what I said? When Muhammad drove Christianity out of Palestine into Europe, Europeans began to wake up and shake up, and they ain't cool down yet. You listening to me? That's how they woke up. Christianity, wherever Christ goes, people wake up. They, they get a new appreciation for themselves. And, and, and the light of inventive genius and everything else begins to crackle around where the Bible goes. You better listen to me. But way back yonder, before Muhammad drove Christianity out of Palestine into Europe, and while the European was in semi-heathenism, down in Africa, where folks would be ignorant, they're keeping the Sabbath. I didn't say Sunday, I said Sabbath. I'm going to talk some history to you. Now you can find this in the records of the Ethiopian Coptic Church, which I've had to examine so I could talk with some authority. See? And I'm not fooling you. Before I'd fool you, I wouldn't fool with you. I think you know that by now. And I'm not very careful about what I say anyhow. And the reason is, it's too late to be careful. We're standing on the threshold of the coming of the Lord, and most of the folk in Nashville don't even know what you've heard tonight. Don't know it! Been paying out their good money for years for teachers to teach it. And all they get is a bump and a groan and a heavy moan. He go home and say, That's wonderful. Yeah. What'd you preach about? Oh no, but it was good. <laughs> kind of like taking a bath and it wears off. Church ought to be teaching you something. Amen. You better, better believe it. Church was set here to get you ready for the coming of the Lord. Amen. And here we are, sitting down here on the threshold of the coming of the Lord. Right. And people still don't know. And they'll go to church tomorrow not knowing. At least you'll go knowing. Because I told you. And when you come up before the Lord and you haven't kept this true day. And you're well Lord, I I didn't know. I'm going to jump up behind the throne and say, he lying Lord, I told you. (laughs) You ain't. I'm going to get you boy. I'm going to get you down there just as sure as you bone. I'm going to tell on you. Now, let me tell you how the Sabbath got to Africa. The Queen of Sheba paid a visit to Solomon. The Bible says that he told her everything that was in his heart. And being a Jew, the Sabbath sure was in his heart. Also, there were some children born from that visit. 
Which is why the Ethiopians look so Jewish. While they look so usish. Uh, don't worry about it. Get that next week. Now, uh, now she brought Sabbath back to Ethiopia. And today, Coptic literature indicates that Saturday was the national holy day for the Ethiopian Coptic church. Black folk kept Sabbath. But that's not all. Way back in Liberia, there's a little old obscure tribe that they discovered that had the thing right. While all over the world, folk are running down keeping a day that the Catholic Church gave them. All right. And that they got from Constantine, who was a pagan. Did you hear me? Yes, sir. It's even named after the S-U-N, which was the original god of the heathen. You're not listening. You look up in your, your, your encyclopedia, uh, Isis and Osiris. Look up Boulder, huh? And look up some other things. The temples to the sun that were built in Egypt. And that worship, the orgies that went on in those temples in honor of the S-U-N. And then go back to your calendar and look at how Sunday is spelled. S-U-N-D-A-Y. And you've been thinking it was the S-O-N's day. Son of the living God. And somebody called it the Lord's day. And they don't even know where it came from. The first two people to call Sunday the Lord's Day were Clement of Alexandria and Tertullian of Carthage. I'll say it again. If you got a tape recorder, blessed are you. If you haven't got one, stop down the hall and buy the tape on the way out. The young man's selling them. I'm not getting anything out of it. I just want you to have the information. A man by the name of Tertullian of Carthage, a Carthage, and a man by the name of Clement of Alexandria. These were the two first men to ever use that phrase Lord's Day with reference to Son's Day. When the Son was worshipped as a god and dedicated to Balder and Isis and Osiris. Well, there it is. And here you are with a head full of information now. And the question comes, what will I do about it? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. If you don't love him, forget you ever heard it. But if you weren't lying, when you testified, I know I love the Lord. I've been serving him now for 30 years. And he never let me down. And I'm going all the way with him. Remember the last time you testified to that? Now, if you were not lying, then whenever you learn what the will of God is, and you have the love of God in your heart. You'll do it. Amen. You'll go to a lion's den. Rather than give it up. You'll let them like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. You'll let them burn you with fire. Rather than give it up. How deep is your love? How profound is your faith? And what about your respect for God? These are the questions involved in the issue that I've laid on your brain tonight. You can know how much you love him. You can know how deeply you believe in him. You can know how fully you respect him. By the way you relate to his commandments. And that's what the commandments are all about in these closing minutes. Amen. They were never given you to save you. That's right. Exactly. The man said, oh, the, the, the Sabbath won't save you. Lord didn't give it to save you. The mirror won't wash your face. Amen. But it'll sure tell you you're dirty. Talk to me. The mirror was put there to tell you what you need. Yes. Amen. The law of God is put there to tell you what you need. Amen. And it takes the blood of Jesus Christ to supply the need. Amen. But you don't look into the mirror and say, well, I'm going to break this old mirror because it's telling me the truth. Wham. Say, I know I'm all right. And then go out looking like you're looking if you weren't looking like you're looking. So we come down to this closing moment. I'm not going to ask you to stand up, make any public demonstration of faith. I'm not going to ask you if you believe what I said, because I know you do. You don't just believe it, you know it's the truth. 
What I want to ask you tonight is, right where you are in your seat, to make a decision. I'm not going to even ask you to raise your hand, signify to me what you've decided to do. Because I'm not your God. But I sure was your preacher tonight. And I laid something on your brain that ought to keep you awake really late, doing some studying. We got some stuff to put in your hands. Have you already done that, ushers? Have you already done it? Then get out there. And everybody that goes by you, don't bring it in here. Just stay out there. And everybody that goes by you, put some of that literature in his hand so he can sit up and read it tonight. And get real sleepy. And miss church tomorrow. It's wrong day anyhow. Today was the day. And then I see him tomorrow night when I talk about the unpardonable sin. Boy, it's going to be a night. Let us bow our heads in prayer.